Hello everyone, welcome to the Meister Piece. I am your host, Susie Meister. My guest today is Dr. Kelsey Berg, who is an assistant professor at St. Norbert's College, and she researches um, sexuality and gender and Christians in contemporary America. And I asked her to come on the show because um, what inspired me to ask her was all this hubbub about Fifty Shades of Grey. And then I remembered her fascinating research and how maybe we could combine topics and be, you know, real hip and talk about something people care about, but really there's a lot more to it. So welcome, Kelsey. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I, people should know, have known you for many years. We went to grad school together and now she's successful and I'm just like hosting this weird podcast. So, you know, academics can really go in many directions. That Yours is true. being preferable, tenure track, writing a book real fancy, the students probably worship at your throne. Is that what it's like? Living the dream. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and you are in Green Bay, right? Yes, it's Green Bay, Wisconsin. Cold. Yeah. What's the, how many people are at St. Nor? did I say it right? St. Nor- Norbert's? St. Right? Norbert, but actually locals say St. Norbert's. Um, oh. So it's in De Pere, which is next to oh, Green okay. Bay, and there are about 2,200 students, so a small liberal arts college. Do they support your, um, you know, research agenda? <laughs> yes, yes. They. Um, I think people are uh, sometimes confused and surprised by it, but <laughs> uh, lots of good conversation, so... Well, because I was thinking it's a Catholic school, you know, to some degree. How much of the student body is devout? Um, I think about half are affiliated, are, you know, are are Catholic. So, but devoutness, I would say less than that. Um, And I don't study Catholics, so. Right. But do you kind of want to now at all? Um, no. (laughs) No. Because I thought I really did. No, less inclined, maybe. (laughs) I thought maybe, because, you know, there's a, a rich mind to be had in that, in sexuality and Catholicism, certainly. Certainly. But you're not into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, like you, grew up with a sort of evangelical background, so that's, I, I know it yeah. much more uh, closely than... Catholicism and now Catholicism seems strangely close to home being here so yeah all right yeah. well so here's the scoop like I said in, when I approached you to do this the I've I saw I keep seeing these things you know like articles and even you know just photos that there was like one I don't know if you saw it where it was like 50 shades of gray poster and then the bible did you see this one I have seen this yeah yeah and it says like which which book do you want your daughter to live by or something like that? And it's like really igniting this rage inside of me. But it made me think of your research. And I was wondering, first of all, just to be topical, if what you think of that, what you make of sort of the evangelical community rejecting the Fifty Shades um, of Grey movie and sort of the content, and if that surprised you at all. Um. It didn't surprise me. I think, so it's interesting that evangelicals have been waging a war on pornography for a long time. So porn is thought to be sort of um, a a war against, waging a war against Christian men. So this has been talked about for a long time as something that young men in particular um, struggle with. So a culture of pornography. So Fifty Shades of Grey has come about as the sort of Christian woman's equivalent that um, evangelicals now have been very um, protective of and wanting to combat the messages that they see as unbiblical. How come you? Because th- maybe I missed it, but I didn't see see this backlash about the book. It seems right. weird that the visual thing is really what they're worried about. Is that, did I miss something? Um, I think that there there has been evangelical commentary about the book, and 
what's interesting, certainly the like increased visibility about the movie has meant more people have been reacting against it. But from an evangelical perspective, the film is no different in the book in terms of the sin it might inspire. So, uh, you know, for sexuality, it, it what happens in the mind is just as important as in deed. So you can <laughs> commit adultery through the lust of your fantasies uh, in addition to any actual deed or action. So viewing the film, reading the erotic fiction, all would um, be suggestive of this kind of lust that, you know, they believe that God would equally condemn. Well, but I I guess what I don't understand is, aside from... I don't know this book or the movie, but they're not married, right? (laughs) They're not married. Right, so they're just banging. And like... It, aside from that, though, how is it different than any other movie? Everybody is banging in every movie. True. Yeah. So I think that um, that is something that, you know, evangelicals would say that they would be critical of all depictions of sexuality that could um, cause a viewer to lust. Right. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 you know, the first obvious problem is that they're not married, the premarital <laughs> sex. And then the second problem is the sin that it might create by its viewing. But whether or not that's different than any other sexual media, I think is questionable. I would say that evangelicals, um, to some extent, have been critical of the, the dom-sub relationship that is, you know, that is conveyed in the film, just like feminist critics have said that this is an ab- abusive relationship rather than one that is consensual. Um, but evangelicals tend to focus less on that yeah. and more on its um, sexual explicitness as really being the problem. Do you think that that is, I know that that's what they would say, but to me it seems like there's also an element at least of um, <laughs> not wanting to encourage female pleasure during sex, which I know is not exact, like your findings we'll get to more in more detail, but they don't discourage pleasure, uh, at least in the forms that you explored, right? That's true. Yeah. And I think that that's a really interesting point. Um, So on the websites that I follow, these are websites, blogs, message boards created by and for evangelical Christians to talk about sexual pleasure in the context of um, heterosexual monogamous matrimony. (laughs) Um, And there's a lot of conversations about um, men struggling with porn. This is something that people talk about, get support for, um, pray about. Uh, But on, so one of the the largest message boards that I follow, just right before Valentine's Day when the film came out, there was an announcement from the administrator that said, we won't talk about Fifty Shades of Grey. We won't even have any conversations about it. And I think probably if somebody approached Fifty Shades of Grey saying that they wanted to, you know, that they felt troubled by their attachment to the film or something like that, that they would find a supportive community. But the, it, that total shutdown of any, any conversation about Fifty Shades of Grey and it's being... Um, geared towards women, I think is is interesting that they're not as willing to um, talk about it, perhaps because it's um, marketed towards women in particular. Yeah. So when I was looking on your website at the um, information about your forthcoming book, does it have a title or is it a secret or what? Well, I have to, my publisher, I think, has to say yay or nay. Right now, the, the title is Piety and Perversion. Oh, that's uh, fun. Yeah, Evangelicals and Sexual Pleasure on the Internet. Here's what I so. love about you. Like, <laughs> you're used to this being what you study, but to me, it is so, like, it's such a novelty. And, like, Piety and Perversion, that is such good times. It, well, it is. Are yeah, you and so I, sick of it, though, or what? <laughs> um, no, I'm not. I'm not yet sick of it. Good. I, yeah. Though it's been a long time. I mean, you knew me when it just was getting started, so it's been a long time. You were in the foreplay stage. <laughs> yeah. At right. That point. That's right. That's right. So, in in the blurb, it said how you noticed somewhat of like a, a difference between what male uh, or men could talk about in the forums 
and what was encouraged for women to talk about it. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that about? Well, I think it's about a, a couple of different things. So, um, you know, there's been a long line of evangelical sex advice through published books and now through lots of different virtual forms, websites, um, blogs, virtual Bible studies, et cetera, and all sort of give um, lip service to a sort of gender egalitarianism, that both men and women should experience pleasure, that consent is something that's important, so you shouldn't be doing anything that a husband or wife um, is not into. Yeah. Um, but under the surface, I think that uh, men have found more room to explore their particular interests. And um, women, for um, various reasons, I suppose, are less inclined to talk um, about a wide range of sexual interests. So I sort of, and this is an oversimplification, but, um, you know, men are able to talk about lots of things, including kinky things. Um, so this is something that I write about. And women sometimes do, but not as often. So they seem to be stuck trying to, like, figure out how to have an orgasm. But that is by far the most <sighs> frequent conversation. no. Yeah, well, I mean, it makes sense that, you know, I think that they believe that sex is supposed to be awesome and pleasurable because God made it to be that, but yeah. it's not intuitive. Um, so for many of these people, they've grown up learning sex is bad, this is the constant refrain, and all of a sudden, after after they marry, then sex is good, and so they have to, you know, navigate what that what that looks like, how to actually enact that. Is your sense that they cannot have an orgasm because of all these hangups and sort of all the baggage attached to it or because their partners are selfish? Um, well, I, I would say that hopefully in, you know, looking to some of these advice forums that they have partners who are not selfish and... <laughs> Um, and the, in part, the forums give women language to prioritize their own pleasure within um, a, a Christian framework, within an evangelical framework. So they can can prevent a more uh, present a more convincing religious argument for why their orgasms are important too. <laughs> okay, wait. So here's what it sounds like. Is it the case that? when you say men have more room to talk about, you know, their interests and then, and then you said on the, in the blurb something about how, you know, you, and you want to make sure that your partner is supportive and all of that. But like, it sounds like women are as sort of acting as an accessory to the facilitation of the male act rather than truly be like, it does sound like lip service to me about equal do you think that's right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I certainly applaud women who um, find themselves within this worldview that, um, for the most part, has um, not encouraged women's sexual expressions, right? Yeah. So that's, evangelicals are, are not known for that. <laughs> no. But yet they find a way to... Um, make pleasure happen for yeah. them, or at least get encouragement to do this. And I think that that's, um, that's a, a sincere, it's encouraging. It's, that's encouraging. I do think that that is encouraging. Um, actually, so an evangelical author who wrote a book called The Sexually Confident Wife, Ha, this is Shannon Etheridge. She has now just come out with a book called The Fantasy Fallacy, which is a direct response to Fifty Shades of Grey. So already, I mean, evangel you know this, that evangelicals are known for being remarkably adaptive when it yeah, comes to that. what is popular in secular culture. So already there has been published response. So what, in, what is, do you know her argument for what the fallacy is? Well, so... You know, Fifty Shades of Grey was published as a sort of way to get um, moms and wives out of their sort of middle-aged ruts, right? <laughs> to encourage some excitement in their yes, lives. Yes, right. Um, and so Shannon Etheridge says that um, that is uh, something that, of course, should be important for these women, but that the way to do it is not by fantasizing about Christian Grey, 
but rather to use um, your spouse as the standard for fantasy. So that's the really interesting piece here is that um, the evangelicals that I study are not opposed to fantasy per se and maybe not even opposed to um, some of the kinky sex play that is described in Fifty Shades of Grey, but their problem comes that um, Christian consumers of the book or the movie have to think about a, a couple other than themselves and their spouse. Um, and that is the, the sinful act, not necessarily what is being depicted. Even if they're fictional. Even if they're fictional, yeah, because they can take on a life of their own in, in people's minds. <laughs> Uh, but the, the line, the line is blurry. I would say the line is blurry. And this is why I think it's interesting to study some of the websites that I study because, um, evangelicals are trying to have very frank conversations about sex, but in a way that, um, doesn't encourage lust or titillation. So, um, it gets, it gets complicated. Yeah. Um, the parameters are very limiting, but they want to sort of you know, encourage expression within those parameters. I remember when you were doing this when we were in school together and I was like, well, what's the end of the story? What is it? And you were like, well, basically is if you're working within monogamy and, um, you know, with your spouse, that everything is fair game. You know, even stuff that you would like pegging and things that we typically don't associate with evangelicals is just fine as long as you're in the a relationship that matches a biblical ideal as they understand it right mm-hmm. so yeah then, go ahead well so the uh, uh an often quoted bible verse is from the book of hebrews so this is that the marriage bed uh the marriage bed is honorable in all and the bed un no i'm sorry let me uh, the marriage bed is honorable in all and the bed un undefiled. Let me start that one more time. The okay. marriage, not the marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. That's it. Okay. So within <laughs> a marriage, um, so long as the, uh, parameters of heterosexuality and monogamy and legal marriage are met, um, there is a lot of room to explore different sexual interests and sexual actions. So yeah, pegging is, you know, something I write about as being a really interesting example. Um, and so I would add in addition to, um, straight, married, and monogamous, that there's this sense of um, gender normalcy. So um, this is particularly true for acts that seem to be kind of gender subversive. So um, I find that men justify these kinds of acts by confirming to other people on the websites that they use that um, God knows that they are truly men and their wives know that they are truly men. And so what they want is to experience sexual pleasure, not to, you know, imagine that they are homosexuals or something like this. That that's sort of like the obvious hang up for um, many, but that <laughs> Do for those people who have an say, hey, in it, wait, I'm not buying that at all. Or are they like, yep, go for it. Peg it. <laughs> I would say that it's a um, it's certainly a minority view among most evangelicals, but there is um, really a culture of respect and dialogue on these websites where difference is um, understood and accepted so long as couples um, present themselves as authentically Christian. So, um, you know, evangelicals who rely on a very personal relationship with God can make a a convincing argument that nobody else can know their relationship with God and their relationship with their wives. So who are they to say that um, pegging can't be a part of a godly marriage? Hey, that is the truth. Well, um, and, but never, ever, ever could you do a threesome though? Nope. Never, ever, ever. That's that. Those are one of, that's one of the rules that, um, yeah, they, they find um, no room for bending. It's funny, though. I'm always um, fascinated by the use of that phrase. Uh, they say things like, um, you know, a Bible-based marriage. Like, the Bible gives you this. But to me, the Bible gives a lot of different kinds of <laughs> marriages that, you know, of course, Old Testament primarily of, you know, 
polygamy, etc., that they would acknowledge not accepting. True. So what's that about? <laughs> this is my hard-hitting jur- journal. <laughs> what's that about? <laughs> what's that about? Yeah, well... Um... So I'm. I am not a theologian. You're the. You're the. I know, but I, that's studies. what I don't get. Like, right. I was wondering if they ever talk about this kind of thing, you know, in those rooms. Like, hey, well, Solomon did it. <laughs> Why can't I? Well, I think that there's. You know, we often describe evangelicals as being biblical literalists, and they yeah. describe themselves in this way. But I think that there is um, a bit more room for cultural nuance. That if pushed, they will recognize so that it just doesn't make sense, for example, to forbid wearing clothing of mixed textiles, right? Even though that's something that the Old Testament forbids. So I think that they, um, would use some of those arguments to get out of that. Well, of course, a man can't have five wives, um, uh, you know, along with all of the other organizations that were presented in the Old Testament. So they nev- they're they never trying to pull that, like, hey, well, so-and-so did it, so I'm going to have some concubines or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be well-respected <laughs> on the sites, no. I'm, su- I'm actually surprised. Because you'd think there'd be people looking for some loopholes. Yeah. But well, and this is, I mean, a, a question of the internet. So sh- mm-hmm. anybody could, you know, present any version of Christianity or of religion that they would want. But um, I find that there's a lot of um, policing and gatekeeping that happens on these um, yeah especially active websites, so that it's um, it's not that anything goes, but that it's a, a lot goes. Yeah, and they seem to limits. be having, like, an honest dialogue about, and they're all, they, they seem to be sincere for the most part. Like, they have this issue or a question and people weigh in, right? Mm-hmm. Well, okay, and so what, this porn situation, because... I hear about it. I hear it in sermons too. They talk a lot about it in church now, and because it's obviously, you know, hard to avoid. And so, what is their solution? Just cold turkey, don't do it. Well, I mean, so they have some innovative solutions. So, software programs you can download that you know won't allow you to get on certain sites. Um, accountability partners, so that you um, your um, computer history goes to some another person who can check in on you. So those are some of the like technological innovations. Um, but I think this is in part why um, the websites I study, so Christian sexuality sites, call themselves sex positive because they're saying we're providing an alternative. So you don't need porn. You can actually have great sex Um, in your real life. Um, One of the most fascinating websites in my study is um, a website that produces erotica that's personalized for the couples who are are, um, buying it. So this is a way to enjoy erotic fiction, but um, in order to buy the stories, you fill out extensive profiles about yourself and about your spouse. So what you look like, what your hobbies are, et cetera. And then the story is sort of Mad Lib style. Come um, on. Fill in the, the details about you and your spouse so that you can then read these um, stories and uh, it's still within the confines of, of their religious beliefs. Or um, boudoir photography. This is something that is talked a lot about and seems to be popular <laughs> among Christian women. So this is a way to sort of like incorporate the erotic uh, into Christian marriages in a way that um, at least some people on the internet believe is Wait, what are they taking pictures of? Well, you know, boudoir photography is like, it's, you're not quite nude, but you're close to nude. It's those like... And who's Sultry photographs. Well, so, right. So that's, someone has to see you. So women talk about, you know, making, uh, uh, only allowing other women to be the photographer um, so and that's we, something they, and then they do give it to their p- partner or whatever. Right. And they, and I often talk about like how you need to do things to make sure that it wouldn't get into anyone else's hands. So keep it in a locked box, et cetera. But they, it can be a part of, it can be a part of Christian marriages. I cannot believe what you're telling me, especially the Mad Lib ones. Yeah. Because I mean, 
hey, whatever, but I can't believe there's a market for this. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know how, how well they're doing as a business, <laughs> but um, uh, innovative to be sure. Yeah. Wow. This is enlightening. Okay. So what is next for you in your research? Like, where is this taking you? Oh, that's a good question. I can't seem to avoid being interested in evangelical Christianity and sex. Um, So I think I'm actually, pornography is something that I'm interested in examining more. So how evangelicals engage um, with porn culture. Um, Mark Driscoll, who is a well-known evangelical pastor, ex-pastor, I suppose, um, you know, he publicly debated Ron Jeremy um, over pornography. So they um, have a certain closeness to the porn industry as they combat it. Um, So I'm interested in some questions related to how that happens. Wasn't there some things that you went to, like a convention or a group or something? It's not just online that you've That's true. Yeah. So I went to um, a handful of conferences, some geared just for women, um, some geared for just married couples. So all based on, um, for the most part, published Christian sex advice that then um, authors sort of take tour uh, throughout American churches to talk about um, their messages. Bedroom, or is it just like how to be godly and still be sexual? No, how to, how to spice up how to spice up the bedroom. At one conference I attended, um, it was a small conference in a small church, but they had a raffle for participants, and the raffle was a vibrator that. Come on. Um, no, it was, and it was in a it was in a box, but it was like at in the sanctuary at the church, w- along with people's names that they entered in. Um, does this shock it. you at all? Because I cannot picture this at any of the churches I've ever attended, whether for personally or for my research. Yeah, it shocks me. Yeah, yeah. it does. I mean, I would never have thought that that was happening anywhere. I'm mm-hmm. glad for them, <laughs> but That's right. I'm still surprised. Yeah, it is surprising, and I think um, – you know, I should not overstate that this is um, something that all or even most evangelicals are participating in yeah, because yeah. I think you're right to say like, yeah, that's that's unusual. Yeah, and that's like true. Subculture. Yeah. And I think that's a good word to describe it. I think that they, um, especially Christian sexuality websites, start at the place of very well-established religious Norms. tenets, yeah. right? So, right. So this is um, you know, monogamy, heterosexuality, marriage, most all evangelicals agree on that. Um, but then they do really interesting things on the internet by sort of pushing where where they can go and still call themselves evangelical Christians or still call themselves Christians. Um, so that's where they become unlike the majority, we would say. Wow. This is awesome. What do you keep in the trunk of your car? What do I keep in the trunk of my... Well, this is a funny... So I have a, an ice scraper and I have a bag of corn. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because um, we go to a wildlife sanctuary where we can feed like geese and ducks. Um, but they don't sell corn there. So but people like bring their own corn. So like we went to a store called Fleet Farm, which is like this farm supply store in Wisconsin. And it's like a... I don't know how... A huge bag of corn that is in the trunk of my car is it husked or whatever they call that <laughs> like oh yeah well it's corn yeah. kernels right like dried oh corn i pictured it on a cob like no, no. some corn in your trunk no no okay corn cool. yeah right like feed gotcha yeah. okay so then you just feed it to these critters geese and ducks yeah and i don't i mean it's my two-year-old who is into this <laughs> this isn't a, a hobby right. of mine yeah, yeah i saw she might be having a goat party that's true. She's That's into awesome. farm animals. Yeah. Okay. So does that take up most of your trunk or is there anything else going on back there? No, it's empty other than the corn and the ice scraper, which is very indicative of life in Wisconsin, perhaps. I thought that you'd have reusable bags for sure. Hmm. Is that what you have in your trunk? I do. But in LA, you know, it's like required. 
Oh, that's they, true. They charge you for bags, right? Yeah, but I thought, you know, you're you're into that stuff. You're a professor. Every professor has like burlap sacks in their <laughs> trunk, yeah. I assume. That's true. I just get those out when I go grocery shopping. So. Oh, okay. Well, right. you're more organized than I am. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Here's the thing I want you to know. When I react to your information, it's not out of judgment to any of it. It's because, first of all, I'm spastic, but also like... This is so interesting and fun and your research is shocking often and provocative and really great for a dialogue, don't you think? Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm always interested um, by the nervous laughter that <laughs> is all, often the reaction, especially in academic spaces, you know, mostly secular academics who um, I think are very uncomfortable with the, the idea that evangelicals may be... Um, may have a relationship with sexuality that they had not previously imagined. Well, that's because it's it seems incongruent. Right. Right? So it's the same way comedy is funny. You know, mm-hmm. when something seems like it'll be one thing and then it's the other, that's funny. So then right. <laughs> everything you say makes me giggle because these are people that if you saw them at church, you wouldn't think they're going home and talking about pegging in a chat room. That's true, yeah. But I'm glad they are. Yeah, I'm. Me too. <laughs> me too. I mean, it, and it's really cool that they have a community and that they can have a conversation about it. Because I don't think that this would have been happening, like, what, you know, in the '70s, for example. Right. Well, the internet makes it all possible because it's a space where people can be anonymous, and I think that means that they can talk about things they wouldn't otherwise talk about in a in a Bible study group. Um, so, I mean, I, the, the only thing that I will add to this sort of rosy depiction of um, uh, all of the sexual possibilities is um, the fact that there are still very clear sexual limits. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it, so they're becoming more sexually progressive within um, yeah, certain themselves. heterosexual, <laughs> with, for themselves, within um, straight and monogamous marriages does not mean that there is any sign, at least in the online communities I study, of um, becoming increasingly accepting of um, gay and lesbian couples, um, certainly not of non-monogamous couples. Um, So there still are limits. Right. That's the bummer. But it is good news that they're doing it, and hopefully they'll let everybody else do it someday. It seems like um, that could be the trajectory. Wow, that's encouraging. Well, Well, good work. Good work, Dr. Merck. Thank you. I'm proud of you, and I love your research, and I hope it warms up for you soon. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. It was great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on The Meisterpiece, and everyone, thank you for listening or watching if you're on the YouTube channel. And tune in next week for more celebrity interviews. Bye, everybody. Bye, Kelsey. Bye. Thanks. Bye. pornography. So Fifty Shades of Grey has come about as the sort of Christian woman's equivalent that um, evangelicals now have been very um, protective of and wanting to combat the messages that they see as unbiblical. How come you, because th- maybe I missed it, but I didn't see, see this backlash about the book. It seems right. weird that the visual thing is really what they're worried about. Is that, did I miss something? Um, I think that there there has been evangelical commentary about the book. And what's interesting, certainly the like increased visibility about the movie has meant more people have been reacting against it. But from an evangelical perspective, the film is no different in the book in terms of the sin it might inspire. So... Uh, you know, for sexuality, it, it what happens in the mind is just as important as in deed. So you can <laughs> commit adultery through the lust of your fantasies uh, in addition to any actual deed or action. So viewing the film, reading the erotic fiction, all would um, be suggestive of this kind of lust that, you know, they believe that God would equally condemn. Well, but I hear, I guess what I don't understand is, aside from 
I don't know this book or the movie, but they're not married, right? <laughs> they're they not have, married. Right. So they're just banging. And like, it, aside from that, though, how is it different than any other movie? Everybody's banging in every movie. True. Yeah. So I think that um, that is something that, you know, evangelicals would say that they would be critical of all depictions of sexuality that could um, cause a viewer to lust. Right. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 you know, the first obvious problem is that they're not um, geared towards women, I think, is is interesting, that they're not as willing to... Um, talk about it perhaps because it's um, marketed towards women in particular. Yeah. So when I was looking on your website at the um, information about your forthcoming book, does it have a title or is it a secret or what? Well, I have to, my publisher, I think has to say yay or nay. Right now the, the title is Piety and Perversion. Oh, that's uh, fun. Yeah. Evangelicals and Sexual Pleasure on the Internet. Here's what I so. love about you. Like, you're used to this being what you study, but to me it is so, like, it's such a novelty. And, like, piety and perversion, that is such good times. It, well, it is. Are yeah. you and so I, sick of it, though, or what? Um, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not yet sick of it. Good. I, yeah, though it's been a long time. I mean, you knew me when it just was getting started so it's been a long time you were in the foreplay stage <laughs> yeah right that that's right that's right so in in the blurb it said how you noticed somewhat of like a, a difference between what male uh, or men could talk about in the forums and what was encouraged for women to talk about am I getting that right yeah mm -hmm. what's that about well, I think it's about a, a couple of different things. So, um, you know, there's been a long line of evangelical sex advice through published books and now through lots of different virtual forms, websites, um, blogs, virtual Bible studies, et cetera, and all sort of give um, lip service to a sort of gender egalitarianism, that both men and women should experience pleasure, that consent is something that's important, so you shouldn't be doing anything that a husband or wife um, is not into. Yeah. Um, but under the surface, I think that our, yeah. you know, our, our Catholics, so, but devoutness, I would say less than that. Um, and I don't study Catholics, so. Right. But do you kind of want to now at all? Um, no. <laughs> no. Because I thought no, I really less did. less inclined, maybe. <laughs> I thought maybe, because, you know, there's a, a rich mind to be had in that, in sexuality and Catholicism, certainly. Certainly. You're not into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, like you, grew up with a sort of evangelical background. So that's, I, I know it yeah. much more uh, closely than Catholicism. And now Catholicism seems strangely close to home being here. So Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, so here's the scoop. Like I said in, when I approached you to do this, the, I've, I, saw, I keep seeing these things you know, like articles and even, you know, just photos that there was like one, I don't know if you saw it where it was like 50 shades of gray poster and then the Bible. Did you see this one? I have seen this. Yeah. Yeah. And it says like, which, which book do you want your daughter to live by or something like that? And it's like really igniting this rage inside of me, but it made me think of your research. And I was wondering, first of all, just to be topical, if, what you think of that, what you make of sort of the evangelical community rejecting the Fifty Shades um, of Grey movie and sort of the content, and if that surprised you at all. Um, it didn't surprise me. I think, so it's interesting that evangelicals have been waging a war on pornography for a long time. So porn is thought to be sort of... Um, uh, a war against, waging a war against Christian men. So this has been talked about for a long time as something that young men in particular um, struggle with. So a culture of poor. Hello everyone, welcome to the Meister Peace. I am your host, Susie Meister. My guest today is Dr. Kelsey Burke, 
who is an assistant professor at St. Norbert's College, and she researches um, sexuality and gender and Christians in contemporary America. And I asked her to come on the show because um, what inspired me to ask her was all this hubbub about Fifty Shades of Grey. And then I remembered her fascinating research and how maybe we could combine topics and be, you know, real hip and talk about something people care about, but really there's a lot more to it. So welcome, Kelsey. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I, people should know, have known you for many years. We went to grad school together and now she's successful and I'm just like hosting this weird podcast. So, you know, academics can really go in many directions. That Yours is true. being preferable, tenure track, writing a book real fancy. The students probably worship at your throne. Is that what it's like? Living the dream. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, and you are in Green Bay, right? Yes, it's Green Bay, Wisconsin. Cold. Yeah. What's the, how many people are at St. Nor? Did I say it right? St. Nor- Norbert's? St. Norbert, but actually locals say St. Norbert's. Um, oh. So it's in De Pere, which is next to oh, Green okay. Bay, and there are about 2,200 students, so a small liberal arts college. Do they support your, um, you know, research agenda? <laughs> yes, yes. They. Um, I think people are uh, sometimes confused and surprised by it, but <laughs> uh, lots of good conversation, so... Well, because I was thinking it's a Catholic school, it, you know, it, to some degree. How much of the student body is devout? What do you think? Um, I think about half are affiliate married, the premarital <laughs> sex. And then the second problem is the sin that it might create by its viewing. But whether or not that's different than any other sexual media, I think is questionable. I would say that evangelicals, um, to some extent, have been critical of the the dom sub relationship that is, you know, that is conveyed in the film, just like feminist critics have said that this is an abusive relationship rather than one that is consensual. Um, But evangelicals tend to focus less on that and more on its um, sexual explicitness as really being the problem. Do you think that that is, I know that that's what they would say, but to me it seems like there's also an element at least of, um, (laughs) <laughs> not wanting to encourage female pleasure during sex, which I know is not exact. Like your findings, we'll get to more in more detail, but they don't discourage pleasure, uh, at least in the forms that you explored, right? That's true, yeah. And I think that that's a really interesting point. Um, so on the websites that I follow, these are – websites, blogs, message boards created by and for evangelical Christians to talk about sexual pleasure in the context of um, heterosexual monogamous matrimony. (laughs) Um, And there's a lot of conversations about um, men struggling with porn. This is something that people talk about, get support for, um, pray about. Uh, But on, so one of the the largest message boards that I follow, just right before Valentine's Day when the film came out, there was an announcement from the administrator that said, we won't talk about Fifty Shades of Grey. We won't even have any conversations about it. And I think probably if somebody approached Fifty Shades of Grey saying that they wanted to, you know, that they felt troubled by their attachment to the film or something like that, that they would find a supportive community. But that total shutdown of any conversation about Fifty Shades of Grey and it's being 